All right, so everybody, thanks so much for listening. We're going to be talking about an important topic today. If you are listening to us on one of the radio stations, we appreciate you. If you're listening to us on the internet, please subscribe to this channel and share this. We've been getting a lot of censorship <laughs> as far as online, unfortunately, but these are important topics and people need to be hearing about this because there's a lot of people suffering. Dr. Tina Pierce back on Fire Breathing Rob again, talking about long haul COVID and many other things that she's involved with. Doc, thanks so much for coming on. Greatly appreciate your time today. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for asking me. So Doc, you've been doing amazing work in the UK with long haul COVID. What are you seeing going on right now for the people that are viewing this and also listening? Um, what I'm seeing is um, patients who have uh, COVID, mostly in March 2020, actually, uh, and September 2020, not so much from last year. And, uh, and they have uh, some symptoms that continue. Um, and cause them problems and they don't seem to be getting better. And um, the, my history is that my youngest daughter has, um, has got mast cell activation syndrome. And I diagnosed her in 2016 when she became really, really ill with it. And prior to that, we had taken her to lots of doctors and nobody had managed to put it all together. And it was because she became so ill that I really concentrated on sorting it out and, um, and, uh, made the diagnosis. So since 2016, I've been treating patients with mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance. And then um, when I started hearing about long COVID in the August of 2020, and people starting to list their symptoms and explain how they felt, I've just recognized them as my mast cell patients. <laughs> And so I started to think, I, I thought that uh, perhaps the COVID had um, stimulated the previously undiagnosed and untreated mast cell activation and had exacerbated it. And so I went on to uh, BBC Look East television, actually, news, and I asked uh, if people with long COVID would download a free app and if they would um, put in their symptom profiles. And I could see if it looked very similar to the muscle activation patients. And 2000 people did, which was really helpful. And we looked at their profiles and it was exactly the same uh, set of symptoms. They had nine, 10, 20, you know, 20 symptoms, some of these patients, and they all were very, very similar to the mast cell activation. So then Rob, I felt obliged morally um, to talk to some of these patients and to open a clinic because I thought I could probably help them. And that was my hope. Um, I opened a clinic in November, 2020. And um, by, um, by the, um, well, within 36 hours, it was fully booked for over six months. <laughs> so um, that showed some of the demand um, because it's a, a lot, an awful lot of people. It's about 17% of the population who have mast cell activation syndrome. And, um, and therefore we would expect, you know, about 17% of the population who get COVID possibly to have it very severely um, or to be left with some mast cell activation and long COVID. So that's my story, really, and where I came to from it um, to try and help people. And lo and behold, when I started talking to them, they did have most most of them, 98 percent of them had a previous history of undiagnosed and untreated muscle activation. What is muscle activation symptom syndrome rather? Well, it's a congenital condition. It's genetic and it's an abnormality in the mast cells. Um, there are these kit genes which um, are responsible for your mast cell formation. And there have been 50 mutations in the kit genes identified that can cause mast cell activation. And the mast cells are very important cells for our immune systems. And, um, and they, um, in mast cell activation syndrome, they're a bit too sensitive. So they fire for stimuli, chemicals, uh, et cetera, that they should just really ignore. Um, so it looks like you're sort of allergic to everything around you. Um, and the, um, the mast cell activation releases, makes the mast cells release a lot of cytokines and chemicals. They release over a thousand different chemicals and 350 chemokines, which are little chemical messengers that talk to other cells. And, and that pushes histamine levels, heparin levels, and various other um, loads and loads, all these thousand cytokines up in the body. 
Um, and these are normal chemicals that are there normally as a normal response to uh, um, an infection, for example, it's part of your immune response. But when they're constantly firing off and constantly being released in the body, they cause inflammation and a whole load of symptoms in lots of different systems. So people's symptoms are usually very disparate. You know, they can have headaches one day, another day they can have hives and rashes. Um, some people have loads of IBS type symptoms and, and so it goes on. So a lot of patients, in my experience, who have been presenting to doctors with fibromyalgia, um, IBS, chronic headaches, urticaria, dermatographism, um, food intolerances, um, et cetera, uh, they are often, well, usually mast cell activation <laughs> patients. There are a lot of people suffering right now. And, you know, personally, I've, I've had my issues with dealing with all these things as far as the healthcare system in general. And I've heard from uh, many people, I have a good friend that worked at a big hospital in Massachusetts, and she is struggling with long COVID with doctors believing her. And a lot of doctors, she says something and they just act like they don't know or they don't want to know or even get involved. What would you tell a lot of those patients that are suffering right now and they're going to these doctors, these specialists that are supposed to be healthcare workers, they're supposed to be caring about people's health and they either don't know or don't care to know? Mm. Well, the mast cell activation syndrome is a fairly newly described condition. So um, it was first... Um, put given a name and sort of put together as a syndrome when somebody realized that they were all connected. Um, and uh, that was in the sort of 90s and given a name in the oh, late 80s, actually, and then given a name in the 90s. And it was, wasn't until 2007, as recently as that, that three case studies were actually published um, in the journals. And that was the first time that it had sort of got out there into the journals. So most doctors haven't been taught about it, they haven't heard about it, and they don't know what to do with it. So, um, you know, doctors like to solve problems and they like patients to present with things that they can say, oh, I recognize this, um, you know, this, 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 these um, patterns of symptoms, and this is what you've got, and this is what we're going to do to make you better. And of course, when they're presented with a whole load of symptoms that are sort of seem to be not connected and very odd and um, and not too serious, but quite debilitating, you know, um, they, they and if they don't recognize that they don't know about it, then they often lose interest um, and they just don't know what to do. So generally, if somebody presents with IBS, they go and see a gastroenterologist and the gastroenterologist may or may not more, more and more now are realizing and learning about mast cell activation. But if they don't know about it, they'll do lots of tests. It's all normal. They send the patient back with, oh, it's IBS. We don't know what that is really causing it. You know, go on the FODMAP diet and it should help. And of course, it helps a little bit, but not, in, not totally because what they need is a low histamine diet. Um, and so, you know, they're is symptoms don't really improve that much. And if they have chronic headaches, they go and see a neurologist who doesn't think about asking them perhaps about their IBS and their fibromyalgia and other things they might have. Um, and so it never gets sort of joined up. The dots don't get joined together. And so often patients really struggle for years and they can have decades of poor health with debilitating symptoms such as brain fog and fatigue and post-viral fatigue, ME. These are all, you know, part of the same thing in my book. And, um, and they, they just don't get anywhere. And it's very frustrating for them. Very, very frustrating. But I do feel, Rob, that the tide is turning and that more and more doctors are becoming aware of mast cell activation, partly because more patients are becoming aware and there is more information on the internet. There's more information on you know, YouTube videos, podcasts, and so on. More of us are talking about it. And, um, and so, they are increasing the awareness, which is fantastic. And, you know, I have patients writing to me from all over the world, actually, saying, heard a podcast or saw you on YouTube, and, um, and it's made a huge difference to these symptoms that I've had for decades and nobody could help me with. Um, and, the, you know, so there are things that can be done. For the patients who are feel like they're going up against a brick wall all the time, I would actually recommend they see a functional medicine practitioner. Mm because the functional medicine practitioners are much more into the approach that we have to take with the long haul um, COVID and with mast cell activation. You know, we, it, we have to look at 
lots of different aspects, not just uh, the presenting symptom necessarily, but we, you know, we, we need to look at their genetics, we need to look at their, their uh, methylation in their liver, um, their gut, their microbiome, and so on. Mm. So you have to look at a lot of different uh, factors to try and help their body to calm down, the mast cells to calm down, and for them to feel better. What should people do if they go to a functional medicine doctor to maybe this will help if they get this back under control again, because this is not going to leave their body. It's a virus that stays with you your life. How can they get that under control with that functional medicine doctor? Well, there are various supplements um, and preparations that can be taken, uh, which don't need a prescription. So things like monolaurin, uh, which comes from the noon tree. Um, and can help your body to, um, to clear the virus. So uh, monolaurin, L-lysine, for example, and so on. So a functional medicine practitioner would have these, uh, would have the knowledge to be able to help people's systems calm down and to, to clear some of these viruses. Um, and, uh, and mycotoxins, obviously you've got to get rid of the source. So there's no point in treating yourself if you've still got mold in your house. And of course that can be very expensive and a costly thing to do, but it's so important that the mycotoxins have to be cleared. You know, if you've got mold in floorboards and things, they have to be ripped out and new floorboards put in, um, tanking done for uh, damp proofing and so on. So really, really important. And then the, the practitioner would work with the patient on clearing what's in their bodies because the mycotoxins stay in your lungs and so on. So um, they would uh, often things do things like take podarco tea, which comes from the Amazon that can help your body clear it um, and uh, various binders like spirulina and charcoal and so on. But it's really important for somebody to have a practitioner guide them through this because it's otherwise it's a little bit confusing to try and do it on your own. But certainly there are some really good functional medicine practitioners and nutritional therapists who who have the knowledge and the experience to do this. Dr. Tina Pears, drtinapears.com. Definitely check her out. Doc, as we keep going into the interview, I want to get into some of these audience questions. We hear a lot about microclotting right now. Can you tell the viewers about that and what we should be looking for with that involved in COVID? Yes, um, it, it appears that the spike protein um, causes uh, an increase in clotting, um, and that is both from the virus itself and from the vaccine, because of course the vaccine makes us make the spike protein. And, um, and so uh, there's been an increase in, um, in clotting disorders, such as um, heart attack strokes, um, pulmonary emboli. Um, and so people need to be very mindful of that. Um, we are actually... We, we really recommend early treatment for COVID and the early treatment for COVID, you can have a look on the FLCCC website and the World Council for Health website. There are protocols on there and they include anticoagulants such as aspirin, which people can easily buy over the counter um, and take every day to reduce their clotting risk uh, and be aware that of this increased risk and therefore take the necessary measures. The, in long COVID, um, we think that there could be microclots um, in the body still forming and that that is perpetuating some of the symptoms and there are clinics that have opened in um, I think it's Cyprus and Germany where they're doing apheresis and they're actually cleaning out the blood and getting rid of and clearing the microclots um, so we're watching that with great interest to see what success they have with that and they also put people on anticoagulants so um, things like lumbrocinase can be bought over the counter and that uh, is an anti a natural anticoagulant. So sometimes people opt for that rather than the, um, you know, rivaroxaban and things like that, which are prescribable anticoagulants, um, go for a more natural approach. Uh, so yes, yeah, so clotting is an issue. Uh, it seems to damage the spike protein also seems to damage the endothelial lining of the arteries. So there have been, that can cause issues. And of course that will increase clotting. Um, increased clotting problems. So people need to be very careful. And I would suggest that if somebody is going, chooses fully with it, fully informed consent to have the vaccine, that they should prepare for the vaccine. Don't just turn up and have it, but actually do your homework, really look at the 
VAERS data and uh, the this you know the PubMed studies that have been published in various journals to look about safety and whether your risks of COVID um, is it worth your while um, really are you at great risk or not um, should you be taking the vaccine or not and then prepare for it by doing things like taking aspirin before you go for the vaccine. Um, and I would take enteric coated aspirin. I think in America it's 325 milligram dose is what you get can get. Um, and I would also take antihistamines before you go for the vaccine. I would take uh, something like loratadine or cetirizine, 10 milligrams, three times, four times a day, a day, a couple of days before you go, and for, for a week, a whole week, 10 days after you've had the vaccine. And I would take quercetin, which is a mast cell stabilizer. Um, and I would take Pepsid, which you can buy over the counter in the States. Mm. So um, that's a type two antihistamine. And so that would be, say, famotidine and take 40 milligrams twice a day. Um, again, a couple of days before and for a week or 10 days after the vaccine. I would definitely do that to minimize the reaction of your mast cells um, and to hopefully have fewer symptoms. So we're seeing a lot of the people that got the vaccine and also have long COVID have the same sort of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Is that just mainly because of the spike protein, Doc? Well, we're seeing, um, we're not quite sure. We're seeing the, um, I'm seeing in some of my patients who, who present with long COVID that they actually were absolutely fine until they had the vaccine and the vaccine has caused the oh. stimulation of their mast cells and caused the long COVID. So I think it's completely misguided to say we should be vaccinating people to reduce long COVID, the chances of, and the incidence of long COVID, because I'm seeing a lot of people who were fine before they had the vaccine and then it's irritated their mast cells and caused the mast cell activation to be more dominant um, and and have problems so um so yes yeah, so i don't think i don't really recommend that anyone should have the vaccine to try and prevent themselves getting long covid at some stage what they should to, to, in order to prevent long covid we should be treating covid early yeah. early treatment is the way to go and um so i've got a friend in south africa dr shankara chetty and people can check him on youtube and um you know he's got lots of information out there on his protocol and um shankara um dr chetty he has trained he has treated over seven thousand people with acute covid and he hasn't had a single death or a single hospitalization. And no, none of his patients have needed oxygen even. Um, and he has got a fantastic protocol, which is, you know, vitamins and minerals, which is what we, I would also say before your vaccine, please take high doses of vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, selenium, magnesium. Um, so make sure you've got those on board too. And he, he uses those and antihistamines and maybe an antibiotic such as doxycycline if um, somebody's getting chesty and there could be a secondary chest infection. Um, and if they've still got symptoms at day eight or nine, he gives them a high dose of steroids for five days, such as prednisolone, 40 milligrams, for five days. And he hasn't lost a single person, you know, and he's, mm. um, nor have they been hospitalized. And, and also very interestingly, he reports that none of his patients have got long COVID. Wow. So, you know, so if you if you work with the body and you recognize that the mast cells are very irritated by this virus and um, and you work with the body to not make it overreact to the virus, then you're going to dampen down that reaction, which will then not allow long COVID to develop, if you see what I mean. And I know you touched on this a little bit in the last answer, Doc. Uh, talking about the vaccine injuries, again, we're not telling anybody not to get the vaccine. I, I have to say this, unfortunately, on the radio and also on YouTube. You get whatever you want. It's your body. It's your choice. And the vaccine may help some people. And that's just the way it is. We'll just leave it at that. I don't want to get myself in trouble, Doc. But going into the question, as far as that goes, we are seeing the people with the vaccine injuries and these people, again, are going to doctors and they're telling them about the injury. And the doctors, again, they, they, they act like they're mental patients. They act like uh, they just want to pump SSRIs, SNRIs on them. And it's really scary because that has nothing to do with the medical issue at hand. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell people that, because we got a lot of this for an audience question, of people that have been suffering for nine months, a year with dizziness, anxiety issues, and all sorts of blood clots, other issues, 
uh, mm-hmm. had that have been going on since they received the vaccine, you know, almost a year ago or even a year ago. Yeah, I know. I think it's it's very, we have that the same scenario happening in the UK where a lot of patients are presenting with vaccine as adverse serious are often right. adverse effects and the um the doctors that they're presenting to aren't necessarily recognizing them as being from uh, the vaccine Not is it, sorry to interrupt doc i gotta say that is it because they don't want to recognize it or because they don't know to, uh, about I, recognizing I, it. That's think, the question. You know what? I think it's a combination of the two, actually, Rob. I think <laughs> I think sometimes the doctors just haven't done their due diligence. They haven't done full research, and they're not up to date with the latest data, and so they are um, ignorant of a lot of the va- of the vaccine adverse effects that can happen. Now, in, on November the 17th last year, um, Pfizer were compelled to release um, yes. a document I- including their safety data, and I don't think many doctors would have read that. Um, And if they did take the time to read it, they would see that there were nine pages of serious adverse effects. Nine pages. That was 1,291 serious adverse effects. Now, I don't know of any other drug that has more than a dozen adverse effects. And to have 1,291 is extraordinary. And it really is beholden to all the doctors globally to make sure that they know about this. You know, they're recommending, in many cases, they're recommending this for patients. So they should absolutely know what all the risks are so that first of all, they can get fully informed consent from their patients. And secondly, it's ethical then if they've recommended something to the patient and they do have the unfortunate, um, you know, are unfortunate enough to have an adverse effect that the doctor then knows and recognizes it as such, supports the patient and knows how to tr- try and treat them and help them. Um, and it seems um, bizarre that these poor patients are being told uh, it couldn't be when it obviously is is um, the vaccine. I had a patient last week um, who came into my clinic in Harley Street wearing on crutches and she had had a very severe reactive arthritis after the first dose of the vaccine. So so it was so bad that she could hardly walk and then it, it slowly recovered over a few weeks and when she asked her GP you know I had this reaction I'm not comfortable with having a second dose Um, they actually encouraged her to have the second dose and said, oh, no, you'll be fine. It's much more important that you should have that than COVID, which is debatable, you know. (laughs) And so she did have the second dose. And of course, that made it even worse. So then she had found she couldn't walk unless she had crutches. And in fact, it made her arthritis so bad. She had to have two knee operations. Um, And they encouraged her to have the booster, which I cannot believe she actually went and had. And when she saw the rheumatologist, yes. And when she saw the rheumatologist, he said to her, almost hush, hush. I've seen loads of cases like you. And it is from the vaccine, but don't tell anyone, he said to her. Don't Sad. tell anyone. It's like, what's the big secret? You know, if pa- patients have got this and they need help, then we need to be honest and open about it and we need to help them. Um, so I found that extraordinary. When when I saw her, I said to her, oh, this is definitely the vaccine. I've seen so many patients with the same scenario. And she was, she almost kissed me. She was like, I can't, I'm so happy to hear you recognize what I've been feeling and saying, and mm-hmm. my, you know, is right. It's definitely that's what's happened. So, um, yeah. So we we have to we have to support these patients. I had a, an um, I had another patient um, who had uh, I spoke to about five or six weeks ago, and in June she'd had her second dose, and she went completely blind three days after. Wow. That's yeah. really scary. Very scary. This poor Jeez. woman, very fit and healthy in her 40s. She's got a 13-year-old wow. daughter. She's a single parent. Oh she was a PT engineer. And um, and she went completely blind. And when she saw the neurologist initially, she said to him, I think it's the vaccine. And he said, no, 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 no. But when she saw him again in November... Um, and by this time, a little tiny bit of her sight had come back, thank goodness, but not enough wow. to drive, not enough to work, you know, just enough for her to be able to get around her house without falling over. Um, and he said to her, she said, 
he was all over her like a rash and he was full of apologies saying i am so sorry i'm so sorry it was definitely the vaccine i've had several more cases like you since june and he said i've also got two women on the ward at the moment one who had went completely blind um, just two days after the vaccine and the other one who is blind and paralyzed wow so that's he, really he disgusting so he was starting to recognize that this was a real issue but you know patients aren't being told this when they're consenting are they no <laughs> I, I wasn't told it when i was you know i was given the jabs and i i wasn't uh, told these are the risks this is what could happen all they do is they they tell you to sign a paper and i remember i asked my uh primary care and they say go and get it get it and there's no, and my thing, and this is why I was told, I believe by Dr. McCullough when I interviewed him, is he said, no doctor should be telling you to get it. They right. should say, it's up to you. It's yeah. your choice to get it yeah. or not. Yeah. Yes. Not that you yeah. should get it. An important point is that um, the um, the vaccine is actually experimental still. It was still in those three studies. So in fact, the Nuremberg Code and the Helsinki Declaration very clearly say that doctors must not recommend anything that's experimental to a patient. That's against the code uh, and the declaration. So we should not be recommending it to anybody. Um, it's experimental. And therefore, you're absolutely right. We, and Dr. McCulloch is absolutely right. We should be saying to patients, this is the data. This is what we know. This is what we know about COVID and your risks of COVID. And this is what we know about the, the vaccine and the risks of the vaccine and the efficacy of the vaccine for better or for worse. Um, and then it's up to the patient to decide. And it's a balance of risks and benefits. You know, is there a real risk um, to just not having it? Or is that risk actually very, very small and minimal for them? Uh, you know, the, the, in, the infection fatality rate for COVID is less than 1%. Right. Um, the vast majority of the population. So you have to remember what you're doing it for. And is that a great risk to you personally? Well, no, to somebody like you and me, no, it's not. Um, you know, we would, we would weather it fine, especially now that it's Omicron. Omicron is, um, is very, very mild in most patients, not everybody, but in most patients, Omicron is very mild. And in some people, it's no more than a sniffle for half a day, you know, like a cold, and then they get over it. So one has to weigh all of this up when you're making your decision. There are people in this country and abroad that have mm. got four shots of this vaccine. As you just stated, it's yeah. only for the Wuhan variant. It's not yeah. for Omicron XE. Yeah. It's not for BA1 or BA2. I so what is the purpose? Should people that are elderly, they're saying people over 65, people over 50, I've heard even get this vaccine that have comorbidities. Do you believe that? Do you agree with that? What is your take on all this? Uh, my personal opinion is that anyone who has comorbidities and is over the age of 75 should be given all the facts and then fully consented if they want to have it. Because it's in the elderly age group that there's a bigger risk. Um, and right. um, so the average age of death in this country in England for, from COVID is 84 for women and 81 for men. And they had comorbidities. So I know of 90 year olds who were fit and healthy who caught COVID and were fine. Wow. <laughs> and um, so it's, I think it's a lot to do with the comorbidities. We know that 78% of people under the age of 65 who have died from it in this country um, had at least one or two other comorbidities were usually obese and had low vitamin D levels. So it's very, very straightforward to make sure that you have plenty of vitamin D. Um, and uh, the vitamin D level, you know, doses that I recommend are 5,000 international units a day. Um, if somebody has COVID, they can go up to um, 20,000 units a day, which is what Peter McCulloch now um, recommends in his protocol for early treatment. Um, and um, so, you know, there are lots of things people can do. They can lose weight um, and do their very best to do that. They can um, make sure they've got lots of vitamin D on board and they can be as fit and as healthy as possible. Cut out the carbohydrates, reduce the sugar intake, have a healthy diet, less processed foods, um, which I know are very big in the States, aren't they? Yeah. And a lot of fast food, a lot of processed food. You know, if you go back to basics and have really good 
um, it's preferably organic food. I know it's more expensive, but if you can, um, then you're going to be as healthy as you possibly can be. The chances of dying from COVID then are really very, very, very low, especially if you also educate yourself about early treatments and make sure you've got them in the cupboard <laughs> and that you're taking your vitamin C, your vitamin D, your, um, your zinc, selenium, magnesium um, and your um, aspirin um, and you are um, taking uh, you know, antihistamines, pepsid type one antihistamines such as cetirizine, loratadine, things that you can buy over the counter, quercetin, the mast cell stabilizer. So these are the mainstay treatments of acute COVID um, get help, though, from a doctor if you've got a chesty cough and you need some antibiotics. And if you're still having symptoms at day seven or eight, um, you know, you should be getting a dose of steroids, a, a course of steroids for five days. But, um, you know, there's a lot people can do for themselves. Um, and so I think that on balance, anyone under the age of 65, um, 75 has to think very carefully about whether the risks outweigh the benefits. And the fact that it's the Wuhan spike protein just doesn't make sense to me now to be having that. Wow. <laughs> no. And Omicron is so mild. What are we, what are we frightened of? What are we worried? What are we running away from? Omicron is, is now endemic, you know? Yeah. So BA2, I know you guys just got done with BA2 over there. And now, um, we're talking about maybe here in XE, maybe where you are. I know it's still very low hospitalizations, very low um, mm -hmm. uh, cases in general. Uh, they're told that, and I don't know because I don't know who to believe anymore, but they're saying that the cases in the U.S. are going to go up within the next month uh, for BA2. And then obviously XE is on the rise after that. You know, what's your take on all this? So, well, what my take is that I think there are always going to be viruses around. They're always going to be mutating and they're always going to be coming at, at us. And we have to get on with our lives and we have to do proper scientific um, methods. You know, we, we need to follow proper science, not pseudoscience. So wearing masks is a waste of time. And, uh, and I really don't, I don't think, support that at all. Um, I think that there are certain things you can do. There are certain nasal sprays here in the UK you can get, which have got carrageenan in them, um, which there's one called, it's from Boots actually, and it's called um, Dual Defense. And if you squirt that up your nostril for six hours, any virus that lands in your nostril will be killed within seconds. Is this what they're talking about with the saline nose? Uh, that's more, I think that's more for washing out, but this one actually kills the virus if it lands. So, you know, one can take sensible, reasonable precautions like spraying that up your nose for every six hours if you're going to be out on the train or you're going to be with people or whatever. Um, right. And, um, and you know, and, uh, and, and also making sure you've got the, all the relevant vitamins and minerals on board and you are as fit and as healthy as you can be to boost your immune system because we must go back to nature. You know, nature is good and it has always stood us in good stead for, this, you know, millennia. Um, we mustn't forget about nature. It's almost like we've, we have forgotten about our own immune systems and our bodies are very strong. And yeah. so look after your body, look after it, you know, treat it with respect, keep your vitamins and minerals up eat healthily, don't smoke, don't drink too much, lose weight, exercise, um, and boost your own immune system. Give yourself relaxation, meditation, uh, et cetera, to look after yourself mentally and physically. And then, yes, there will be other viruses that come, but generally viruses, when they mutate, they become less aggressive and more right transmissible so that's what they want to do they don't want to kill their host they want to just get into more hosts <laughs> so they they generally become more contagious and less virulent and we have to wait and see but you know get stuff in your cupboard so that if you feel you're coming down with something you can take the antihistamines you can do what's right to support your body um, and believe in nature and let's get back to sort of grassroots really and get on with our lives we mustn't ruin it for the future generations we mustn't you know, the children have had such a tough time yes. in doing this. It, they have been the biggest, um, the, the biggest tragedy of all is the children. You know, walk, they, they, uh, it's affected them mentally. We've got apparently 30% of our children now have mental health issues. 
no, this is inexcusable. What are we doing? To, what are we as, as adults doing to our children? And if they see people walking around in masks all the time, they can't develop their speech. They can't develop their interactions, their social interactions properly. They can't interpret facial expressions because they can only see the eyes. Um, they, maybe they can't hear the teacher in school so easily because she's masked. Maybe the teacher can't hear them so well. And the, so the child, the te teacher can't see their facial expressions. So they can't see if the child is struggling or if the child is unhappy or uh, or asking a question you know this this is terrible this is terrible that we shouldn't have any masks being worn anywhere like in florida i think your your um your your governor is amazing <laughs> i'll tell you something that's uh, quite extraordinary i'm <laughs> i'm linked into a whole load of uh, medical staff on various groups on whatsapp and so on and um the nurses who were unvaccinated were always having to cover for the vaccinated nurses who were off sick with COVID. And it became a bit of a joke, really, that they were having to do all these extra um, shifts because all of their colleagues who were either off with vaccine injuries or were ill after they had the vaccine or they had COVID. And yet, the, you know, the managers were pushing for everyone to have the vaccine, in which case they would have had nobody left on the ward, you know. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I mean, I'm sure your, some of your listeners would know that um, the British government was saying that we all of the medical staff had to be vaccinated and they were bringing out this vaccine mandate. And there was at least 110,000 nurses and doctors who were going to get sacked by the first of April on the 1st of April of this year because they ref were refusing to be vaccinated. And a very important question people need to ask why would 110,000 dedicated nurses and doctors who'd worked and studied extremely hard to get to their to get their qualifications and to get their jobs, why would they be willing to lose, rather lose their jobs than take an injection that's experimental? What yeah. are they seeing that the general public are not seeing? What are they exposed to and what do they know that the general public don't know. And I think that's a really important question and pe critical, people need to start thinking critically about the, and logically about what's going on. And luckily they, the government stepped down on the mandate, um, right. but I, I'm worried that they're going to try and get it in through the back door by asking the regulation, you know, the regulatory bodies like the General Medical Council to say, uh, and the, the Royal College of Nursing to say, you have to have had it to be able to register with us to practice. So we shall see, we shall see right. because we shall push get back against that as well. There is no logic. Anyone who's vaccinated can catch and spread the virus just like anyone who isn't vaccinated. So right. you don't have the vaccine to protect anyone else because you can catch it and spread it. You know, you, the only reason somebody would have the vaccine is if they decided that for them personally, it's a good choice. And therefore they're willing to take the risk of any adverse effects that might happen to them if they are fully informed and with full, full consent. You don't have it to protect society because you can catch it and spread it just as much as anyone else. And in fact, we think there's something called shedding that goes on as when you've had your first, when you've had the jab for two weeks, you shed the spike protein and so you can give it to people. So, wow. so, so actually you're more dangerous if you like, <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, it, it, the, because not all the facts are out there, people are getting a very skewed picture and everything isn't being portrayed as transparently as it should be. Yeah. So it's very, very difficult for the population, for the ordinary man in the street and woman in the street to make a very sensible decision about who to believe and what to believe. It's very confusing for them, you know. Because we, they we, censor everybody. Yes, you know? but we have this fantastic website, um, Rob. It's the worldcouncilforhealth.org, worldcouncilforhealth.org. And it's unbiased, um, scientific, data, uh, you know, uh, evidence-based data on that website. And it's got information about protocols for the treatment of acute COVID, for how to boost your immune system and stay fit and healthy, um, for treatment of long COVID, and also for vaccine adverse effects. So I'd recommend everybody has a look at our website and there's some very interesting presentations in the video section by various different scientists um, and doctors, frontline people who've got experience um, in, in with COVID. 
Yeah, definitely check it out. Again, Dr. Tina Pierce, P-E-E-R-S. Definitely check it out, Tina Pierce, doc, drtinapierce.com. Uh, doc, <laughs> thanks so much for coming on here. I know we didn't hit the menopause topic. We can, <laughs> we can get that. You know, I got so many questions on this, and I wanted to get to that. But maybe next time, if you're gracious to come on again, I really appreciate it. Uh, we can get into that. So I appreciate you coming on again. It's a pleasure. Lovely to talk to you again, Rob.